Hi, you guys. Uh, this will be the last recorded session that I think we'll need to do this semester, and this also catches us up so that um, tomorrow we can get back on track with the syllabus as originally planned. <clears throat> so we'll be talking about Jacob 7 and then Alma chapters 1 through 3. It'll feel a little strange that we're jumping so far ahead from Jacob all the way into the beginning of the book of Alma, but uh, you'll see why, and you've probably already got a sense of why in your reading, but uh, you'll see why as we go through this session together. Um, really, the reason I pulled these together is because from these chapters we have three symbols of how the av of the adversary, meaning Satan, and how he works. We've talked about him a lot this semester. Um, I think today is a, is a super insightful way to think about the adversary. Um, and so we're going to start off in Jacob chapter 7. And specifically, we're going to talk about Sherem. This is an interesting um, chapter for Jacob to make sure to include because he talked, you know, in chapters 1 through 3, he uh, included this address that he gave to his people uh, where he decried wealth and he decried um, the, their practice of polygamy. And then 4 through 6 was really what he was writing or what he felt he should write for his descendants and for the descendants of the, of the people of Nephi. And, and there he had... Um, there he had um, the allegory of the olive tree, which uh, we talked about in the last recorded class session. <clears throat> so what's next here is interesting because it's an actual event from Jacob's life, an encounter he had with uh, essentially an antichrist. Um, in fact, uh, the Book of Mormon essentially describes him that way, and he is that way because he says that there will be no Christ. In fact, there are kind of two aspects to Sherem and what Sherem taught. One is Sherem said there will be no Christ and there's no way to know. That second part, there's no way to know, was essentially Sherem denying revelation. Um, in fact, if you look at verses 6 through 7, and again, like the cl last class session, you can pause to read these verses as we go through them. Um, but if you look at verses 6 through 7, you can see where Sherem uh, does this, uh, does this both denial of Jesus Christ and denial of Revelation. Uh, you know, he says, um, he says, Brother Jacob, right, using that uh, language probably in a condescending way, you know, I've really been wanting to talk to you. I want to talk to you about the gospel or this thing that you call the doctrine of Christ and, and to tell you that you're leading these people astray. You're leading them astray because they're, you're not teaching them the right way of keeping the law of Moses. He says that, he tells he accuses Jacob of converting the law of Moses into into the worship of a being that will come many hundreds of years later, specifically Jesus Christ. Sherem essentially said, "This is blasphemy. The law is the law, and that's all we need to worry about is the law." And then he says this toward the end of verse seven: "No man knoweth of such things, for he cannot tell of things to come." And here's the part where Sherem is denying revelation. So it's not just denying Christ. It's denying that God, can, that God tells us about Jesus Christ and, and that there's an ability for prophets to prophesy about what's to come. This is uh, an interesting accusation. My favorite part of this chapter, my favorite part is um, Jacob's response. Although I forgot to say before we get there, I want you to contrast what Sherem says and teaches about the Law of Moses with what Nephi taught earlier when we did um, chapters 25 through 30 of 2 Nephi. Do you remember there we talked about the Law of Moses and, and the, the analogy of the box and the pearl, and where Nephi says we're keeping the Law of Moses, but we're only doing it because it's a commandment. We don't need the Law of Moses anymore because we believe in Jesus Christ and we know about Christ. Here Sherem is trying to roll that back. And he's trying to deny, deny the revelations, not just that Jacob had had about Jesus Christ, but also that Nephi and Lehi had had about Jesus Christ. Now, um, in verses 11 through 12, we get Jacob's response, and I love his response. First of all, he, it really comes in two elements. The first part of the response is to say that, of course, the love of Moses is about Jesus Christ. And he says... He, because Jacob in verse 10 says, do you believe the scriptures? And Sherem has to say yes, because that's where the law of Moses come, comes from. 
So Simon says, yes, I believe the scriptures. And then that's when Jacob says, well, if you, you, you don't understand them then, because they testify of Christ. And he gives us a key to prophets. He says this, I say unto you that none of the prophets have written or prophesied, save they have spoken concerning this Christ. This is a key to prophecy. Prophets chosen by God always testify of Christ. They always do. And Jacob knows this, and Nephi knew it, and Lehi knew it, and Sherem didn't know it, and was, in fact, denying it. Um, but all prophets have only ever testified of Jesus Christ, and this is a key to prophets, is that they will always testify of Christ. And then I love in verse 12 how Jacob adds his personal testimony. He says, this is not all. It's not just that the prophets have written in the scriptures and prophesied of Christ throughout history. J Jacob says, it has also been manifest unto me, for I have heard and seen. And it is also, so he says, I've seen and heard about Jesus Christ. And then he gives us a more important insight. He says, it has also been made manifest unto me by the power of the Holy Ghost. Now we know from 2 Nephi chapter 2, when Lehi is talking to Jacob, that Jacob very early in his life beheld Jesus Christ and, and had revelations about Jesus Christ. But Jacob, even all these years fast-forwarded now, where he's been the leader of the Nephites for a while, the spiritual leader, and is now in this conversation with Sherem, he says not only that he saw a vision, but he goes to the extra length of saying, it has also been made manifest unto me by the power of the Holy Ghost. And, that's, and that is what drives the truth of it home. That is the source of Jacob's testimony, is the power of the Holy Ghost testifying of Jesus Christ which the Holy Ghost always does, just like prophets always do. And here's where Sherem doubles down on his denial of revelation. In verse 13, he says, Show me a sign by this power of the Holy Ghost in which ye know so much. Do you see what he's doing here? He's denying that the Holy Ghost can give revelation. He's denying that God speaks to us through the power of the Holy Ghost. Well, as you know from reading the chapter, that's when Sherem is struck down and recognizes his mistake. So let's skip ahead now, and we'll go to Alma chapter 1, and here we're going to learn about Nehor. Now Nehor, of, of all of the false prophets, Antichrist, in the Book of Mormon, Nehor's uh, activity was perhaps the most destructive. Um, in fact, we're going to fast forward later, or we're not going to fast forward, but later we're going to get to the story of Alma preaching in the city of Ammonihah, where he meets Amulek, and, and where pretty terrible destruction occurs. Um, and some horrible sins are committed by the people of Ammonihah. When we get to that part, I want you to remember that, that that was started because of Nehor. So all the way back in chapter 1 of Alma, Nehor's teachings were what led the people of Ammonihah astray. Nehor, for his part, taught to, or er, 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 forwarded the, the adversary's plans in two ways. He did it by establishing priestcrafts, and there are two elements to the way he was implementing priestcraft. One is sort of the textbook definition of priestcraft, which is telling others what they want to hear in order to generate wealth for the priests that are preaching false doctrine. But part of that also is the creation of enmity with other people. The idea of priestcrafts generally lead to people um, identifying others as their enemies. This will be an important point we'll get to in a minute, but let's start by reading verses 3 through 5 in chapter 1 of Alma. In these verses, you see that, ne that Nehor is going around teaching the people. He says what he's teaching is the word of God, but he does it in bearing down against the church. He says that priests should be popular, meaning they should be promoted based on what the people want rather than the people that God chooses. And he goes on to preach in chapter in verse 4 that all mankind will be saved. There's no need to fear. There's no need to worry, to, no need to repent. God created all men and he's going to redeem all men. Notice how similar this is to the adversary's plan. Remember when we talked in 2 Nephi chapter 2 about the idea that, that Satan didn't want to destroy agency only by compulsion. He also wanted to destroy the law. He wanted to destroy the, the difference between good and evil. And that's exactly what Nehor is preaching here in verse 4. He's saying that there is no good or evil and that God is going to redeem everybody. All men will be saved and everybody's going to have eternal life because the law doesn't matter. 
and uh, and he taught these things, so people started making him wealthy. Well, he became prideful in his wealth, and then when he was confronted by a righteous man named Gideon, um, uh, Gideon who led um, the people of Limhi out of captivity, and we'll read about the, that experience later. Nehor was angry, and uh, and actually fought with Gideon and killed him uh, with a sword. Well, Nehor was hanged for his um, crime, um, and yet his teachings endured. Um, in fact, in verses 19 and 20, you read about how Nehor's teachings lived beyond him. Here, the people who didn't belong to the church of God that followed Nehor's teachings, they began to persecute the people who did belong to the church of God. Um, and they afflicted them with all manner of words, basically insulting them and deriding them making fun of them simply because the people of the church of God were submitting to God's will. They were being humble. And more importantly, they weren't responding in kind, meaning the people of God weren't fighting back. This is an important point because this is an example of what God wants of us versus what Satan encourages us to do. The, the difference is enmity. You see, the people who are endorsing priestcraft, the people who are teaching a, a polluted gospel in order to get wealth and power, they have to attack the people who disagree with them. And they encourage their followers to attack those who disagree with them. Um, for our part, as people of God, we're not supposed to fight back. Um, in fact, there was a strict law, starting in verse 21, a strict law among the people that there should not any man belonging to the church arise and persecute those that did not belong to the church and also there should be no persecution among themselves. Now, despite this, there were some members of the church who <laughs> they couldn't help but give in, and they started fighting back, even e even fighting with blows. And, uh, and it tells us that those people in the church who fought back um, caused a lot of trouble, and there were a lot of hardened hearts that came out of that. And in fact, many of the church members who fought back, their hearts were hardened, and they eventually left the church. This kind of enmity, this encouragement to take on enemies is not the way God works with his children. He doesn't want us to make enemies. And I want you to be thoughtful about the false priests that are in the world. And they're not necessarily teaching a religion per se, but they are teaching false um, doctrine. A sign of that is whether or not they're encouraging you to make enemies of those around you. Uh, think about talk radio, for example. Um, whether it's, you know, conservative or liberal politically or, or any other news source besides talk radio, if they're trying to convince you that other people are your enemies, um, that's a sign that they're not of God. And it really it's priestcraft. They know that they can get your money by getting you riled up. And uh, it can be really dangerous, spiritually speaking. And it will lead you away from the gospel, even if you think they are upholding what you think to be the gospel. It will lead you away from the Spirit, and it will lead you away from God. Um, moving on to Alma 2. Here, rather than destroying the law and saying, you know, there is no sin, like Nehor taught, here we have Amlicai. Now, Amlicai wasn't a false prophet, per se, but he was seeking power over the people, and he wanted to be a king. And he wanted to do it by force. Uh, he was disappointed because he failed at accomplishing what he wanted, and so he gathered his followers and fought a war against against the the remaining Nephites who were righteous and who wanted to, who didn't want to have him as their king. Um, in chapter two, uh, so I forgot to fast forward to this slide. So unless I, the way he reflects the adversary or Satan is the idea of compulsion of others. And, and the destruction of the church. And in fact, in chapter 2, verse 4, you read that, where it says that, it, that Amazai hoped that if it was possible, he would get the voice of the people. He was hoping he could be voted in to eventually become a king by force. Um, but he wanted to deprive the Nephites of their rights and privileges, specifically regarding the church, for it was his intent to destroy the church of God. And so Amazai wanted to destroy the church by force. Um, he 
obviously came to the similar fate of, of knee horror and, uh, and Cherim. He was killed um, in losing the battle against the Nephites that opposed him. Um, and that was the end of all of these people, by the way, and it always will be. In fact, um, Mormon summarizing at the end of Alma chapter 3 makes that pretty clear. And he uses this phrase, and I love this phrase, so let's skip ahead to those verses. At the end of chapter 3 in Alma, verses 26 through 27, I'm just going to read these. And this is just following the battle between the Nephites and the Amlicites. And in one year there were thousands and tens of thousands of souls sent to the eternal world, that they might reap their rewards according to their works, whether they were good or whether they were bad to reap eternal happiness or eternal misery according to the spirit which they listed to obey, whether it be a good spirit or a bad one. For every man receiveth wages of him whom he, list, whom he listeth to obey. I want to read that again. Every man receiveth wages from hi, of him whom he listeth to obey. And this according to the words of the spirit of prophecy. Therefore let it be according to the truth what Mormon is teaching us and what these stories teach us is that uh, we should ask ourselves what wages we want. What wages does Satan offer? Uh, these, these three examples make it pretty clear. Satan offers us destruction and sorrow. God, on the other hand, for his part, Jesus Christ, for his part, they offer us something much better, something more. In fact, if you go back to Jacob... After Sherem um, uh, met his fate, Jacob 7.23 says it came to pass that the peace and the love of God was restored again among the people. In Alma chapter 1, verse 28, after Nehor um, was hanged for his crime, it says, Thus they did establish the affairs of the church, and th thus they began to have continual peace again notwithstanding all their persecutions. Even in the midst of persecutions, the faithful had peace. And then again to Alma 3, verse 24, following the battle with the Amlicites. And they returned again and began to establish peace in the land, being troubled no more for a time with their enemies. These are the wages that God and Jesus Christ offer us. They offer us peace. And that's what Sherem was seeking to destroy. That's what Nehor was seeking to destroy. That's what Amlicite was seeking to destroy. And that, in the end, is what the adversary is seeking to destroy. Satan wants to destroy our peace. He wants to do that by convincing us that there's no Christ or revelation. He wants to do that by convincing us that there's no sin and that we ought to have enemies of the people around us. And he wants to try to compel us to, to destroy the church through compulsion if necessary. These are all the things that the adversary does, all with the intent of destroying peace. And, and God and Jesus Christ, if we stay true to them, not only offer us peace, they guarantee it. It is the wage that we are paid by obeying their spirit. So thanks very much. I um, look forward to seeing you all in class again.